It's called Sefer Shal because this is the book that's going to teach us how to be a Bainini. What is the Bainini? So do inside. The Bainini is one who the Nefesh Abahamis, the evil within him, never strengthens itself to the point, to the point that it can conquer the small city, which is a metaphor for the goof for the body, to be able to actually um, express itself in the body and to make it do an Avera, the Hainu, which means, the three levushim of the nefesh b'hamis sheim machshava dibur ma'isa shemitzata klipa machshava dibur ma'isa thought speech and action of klipa ain goverim by al nefesh alakis never never overpower the nefesh alakis li slabish beguf to the point that they can express themselves in the body b'moyach in the mind u b'peh or in the mouth u b'sharei mach evarim or in the other two hundred forty eight limbs la hachtiyam u latamam chas v'shalom to make them do sins or to make them tamay chas v'shalom. Meaning to say, and I think we've spoken about this in the past, the Bainini, from the outside, and the Levushim, and the way the way the Bainini, the Bainini behaves, there's absolutely no way to distinguish the Bainini from the Tzaddik. In the earlier chapters in Tanya, we spoke about how the person's, the human being's um, psychological structure is composed of the Reseichel and Midas and Machshav Adibar Maisa. There's the intellect and there's the emotions, Machshav Adibar Maisa. In terms of Machshav Adibar Maisa, the Benini and the Tzaddik are identical. Both of them are people who never do an Avera and do all mitzvahs that it's possible for them to do. If you to look inside, into the Seichel and Midas, so over there the Benini and the Rasha are identical. So that's the, the divide that there is by the Benini. Rak, only only the three garments of the nefesh alakis, heim levadam they alone mislapshim beguf express themselves in the body shehem machshava di baramaisa shal tayag mitzvah hatera. Person, the old machshava di baramaisa are completely and totally controlled by the nefesh alakis. Vlei over avera miyamav the beinini is someone who has never done avera in his life. And will never do an Avera. He, was ne- he has never been called a Rasha, a Filu Achas, Virega Echot Kalyamav, even one hour or one minute his entire life. How is that possible? How is what possible? You have to be matured, you have to be a kid, what? A young young boy has the ability to. Uh, you have to learn the halachas. Is so the Alter Rebbe, we'll, we'll address your question. Yeah. The Alter Rebbe over here makes two statements about the Benini. Number one, Le'avar Avera. He has never done an Avera. Number two, Vilayavir. He will never do an Avera. How do you, how you know that? And both of these are problematic. Sure. To say that the person has never done an Avera. So, besides, for your question, what do you mean? Of, uh, how, how is it possible to have a bar mitzvah bacher? And the truth is that I can tell you theoretically, yes. The fact that a, at the age of 13 for a boy or at the age of 12 for a girl, a person becomes mechuyiv in mitzvahs. And we know that Eina Kaddish Baruch Hu Mevakesh Ela Lofi Koychan, the Ebishter only asks something which is within a person's ability to be able to do. But that means that, yes, that means that a 13-year-old boy and a 12-year-old girl already has it within their capacity to do all the mitzvahs. And to stay away from Averis, because if it wasn't possible for them to do so, then Hashem would, would not and could not hold them responsible for them not doing so. And the fact is that they are held responsible. But that question aside, if the criteria for being a, a Bainini is someone who has never done an Avera, then we may as well close our books and go home, all of us. Are you really saying that someone who did an Avera once cannot be a Bainini? What's with Tshuva? And what's with... Uh, Next year, the year after, or right? Or maybe it's considered that he, he learns to do tshuva. He does at such a level that it's considered that the sin never occurs, and then that's what you're saying. So one answer that's one answer that well that's one answer that's given is that we know there's a level of tshuva. We learned about it actually in Perek Zayin. It's a level of tshuva that's called tshuva miava. When a person does tshuva out of a deep love for Hashem, we know that a person who does tshuva miava 
Sosdoinus Nasa like Izochius, that Averius become like mitzvah. So that's yes, that's definitely one answer that's given. We know that um, although that time is linear and it always runs forward, but uh, Yid- Yiddish guy tells us, Tayra tells us that uh, as Yidin we have this incredible power to go back in time and to transform events that already occurred. We could take an Avera that happened and transform it into a mitzvah. Something which defies uh, physical science, the laws of science, the laws of physics, but Taylor says that we can do that. That's one answer. But we have to make clear, someone who did an Avera can also become a Bainini. And moreover, someone who did an Avera can also become a Tzaddik. The fact that someone did an Avera, uh, one of the biggest uh, proofs on this is David HaMalach. The Rebbe talks about this. And David HaMalach, we know that uh, David HaMalach, um, he, while he wasn't guilty of the technically of the sins of Chas Shalom of uh, of Eishas Ish or of, of, or of murder, but he definitely sinned and he was punished for it. And the Gemara says very clearly about David that uh, that he that he sinned in two areas, and still we know that David became a tzaddik. In fact, in the the pasuk that we bring for a raya for a tzaddik. That only the only as Yitzchak tell you if we take that from David the Malach because David the Malach says Velibi Chalal Bekirbi my heart is hollow within me Shahargi Betainis then in other words David is the example we give of Tzaddik so obviously Tshuva can make someone into a Tzaddik so what does it mean that he never did Navera so one answer you could say is that if a person does Tshuva Miyava that is that that is indeed one answer but before we before we actually before we address this in another way let's turn to the next thing the Alter Rebbe says Velo Yaver. But a Bainini is also someone who never will do an Avera. What does that mean, he'll never do an Avera? There's no, such assurance. There's no assurance for anyone. There's no assurance for a tzaddik that it's, in other words, we know that it says that Yechnan Koyin Gadol, he served 80 years as a Koyin Gadol. Yeah. Right? It's not in Pirkei Yavis, but as a state. Yeah, oh, okay. And to be a Koyin Gadol, we know that you have to be a tzaddik, because if a person wasn't a tzaddik and he entered the Kedosh HaKadoshim, so that would have been his last... Uh, that the last thing that he did, they state that the, in the second times, the second Bishamik, there were hundreds of Kehanim Gedolim. Because every year on Yom Kippur, the Kohen Gadol would die. They would, they would uh, attach chains to the feet of the Kohen Gadol to pull, to pull out the body. So here's Yechanan Kohen Gadol, who went 80 times. He went into the, into the Kedosh HaKadoshim. We're talking about a tzaddik, obviously, and an Asad Tzduki. And he became a Tzduki. He became a Tzduki. So what does this mean? Le'avar, he never did not have a So again, while there are different answers that are given, including the idea of tshuva, but the most conventional answer, the standard answer that's given is we're not, we're really not talking about the past or the present as they exist in the past or in the present, but we're talking about the past and the present as they exist in this moment, which is kind of interesting. This concept and this idea is that, is my past really in my past or does my past exist right now? We know that it says in Pirkei Yavis, it says, Avera Gereres Avera. One Avera brings, in its wake, it brings another Avera. Just like Mitzvah Gereres Mitzvah. So we know that one Avera brings about another Avera. What does that mean? How does one Avera bring about another Avera? So one way of looking at it is that uh, it's the is uh, pulling the strings. You did an Avera, he's going to orchestrate and the... Uh, arrange that you should be in a situation for another Avera, it's a divine punishment. But it's not, I mean, obviously it's everything's a divine punishment, everything is controlled from above, but it's a very practical thing. Also, we brought down, I believe, I think one of the last weeks, the Gemara that says, the Rabbuna says, that Avar Vishana Nasu Lekehete, you did Avera once, you did it twice, and then it becomes like it's, uh, it becomes like it's permitted. Imagine if there's an Avera, you never did an Avera, a particular Avera, you never did that before in your life. You're always careful about that about that Avera. Whatever it may be in a certain area of Kashras or Muktza, whatever. That Avera for you is almost impossible to do. An Avera you never did. Which Averas do we do? The ones that I did yesterday and I did it three days ago and I did it five days ago. For whatever reason, whether because it's not taboo anymore or whether because my resistance has been worn down, whether because I lack the faith in myself. I don't believe I'm strong enough to overcome this particular Avera, 
Vaharaya, what's the proof that I did it yesterday? I did it two days ago, and I did it. Um, and and I and and then also I felt bad about it and I didn't want to do it, but I did that very anyways. So what does that tell me about me? Obviously, this is all the Nafshah Bahamas, and this is all this is all garbage. But that's the human psychology. Once we've done an Avera, it's very easier. Avera Gredas Avera is very practical. Once you do an Avera, it's very easy to do that Avera again, and then to do that Avera again. And that's also the idea of our Rishana Nasli Kehati. You do it once, you do it twice, it becomes, it, it, it's much easier if you do that Avera. And that's why we look at it. There's certain things that we're very careful about and we're very strong in. And, those, and then there are other areas where almost always we can say that they become patterns, they become cycles. We do it again and again and again. We, <laughs> we become weak in that area. Doing an Avera is not about just about what I'm doing at the moment. It makes me weak in that area. So that's what I'm saying. There's the past. There's what I did in the past. Besides for the fact that I did in the past, the past exists in the present. It's impacting my present. And obviously the same is true the other way around also. When you do a mitzvah once, twice, three times, four times, five times, like imagine someone comes and tells you, tomorrow don't put on film. What do you mean don't put on film? I've done it every single day. Once you, when you're in a pattern of doing it, you keep on doing it, you keep on doing it. There's a nevera also. So our past impacts our present, not only spiritually, not only in a spiritual sense, but practically, psychologically, we're impacted by the past. A person who has done an Aveda is weaker because of it and is more likely to stumble in that Aveda again. Says the Alter Rebbe, if you've done an Aveda, you can't be a Benini because you're weak in that area. And just like we said about the tzaddik, and just like we said about a rasha, it's not only about a behavior. It's about what's stronger and what's weaker inside you. The rasha is the person who the nafsha Bahamas is stronger. The tzaddik is the one who the nafsha lakis is stronger. <coughs> the benini, as we're going to see, there's this balance. But if you've done an aveda, there isn't a balance anymore. Your nafsha Bahamas is stronger in that one area. So the other aveda means that the person has done shuva to the point that he's not currently being impacted by that Avera. He's not weaker anymore in that. Let's say the person, he did an Avera several times eating a chis, eating something which wasn't kosher. He's done shuva and regretted it so much to the point that right now he's not any weaker in that area than he was before he did that Avera. But what's important over here is not what I did 10 minutes. In other words, my being a Benini now is not impacted by the fact that I might have done an Aveda a year ago. Whether or not I did an Aveda a year ago is irrelevant. The question is, what is my spiritual state today? So the question is, is your spiritual state today still being impacted by what you did a year ago? If yes, you can't be a Benini. Not because of what you did a year ago, but because of who you are now. It's still part of your personality. It's still part of who you are today. It's still making you weaker today. So we're talking only about the present and we're only talking about the past and the future as it exists within the present. And the same thing is when the Alter Rebbe says, Aver. he won't do an Aver. What's going to be tomorrow? What's going to be in a year from now? We don't know. But the question is, in the state that the person currently is, if you're looking at the current trajectory, is this person capable of doing an Aver right now? And the answer is that this person, in the state of holiness where he is, the state of commitment and devotion to Hashem where he is, it doesn't make a difference whether the biggest Nisayan, the biggest temptation right now, was put in front of his face, he would not, he would not fall for it. He would be strong. And if this person continues in this level, he will never do an Avera. In other words, when he's saying L'Yavir, the person won't do an Avera, it's not talking about what's going to be in five years from now. In other words, right now there could be a person, he's not doing an Avera currently, but why isn't he doing an Avera? Because he's sitting in his room and he's learning Torah, and he's enjoying it, so he's not doing an Avera. Is this person capable of doing an Avera? Perhaps, if he was in a different setting, he'd do an Avera. Le Yaver means, he, won't, he, he, will, he will never do an Avera, means that it's not just practically, actually, right now he's not doing an Avera. He's in such a space, he's in such a state, we're doing an Avera by him is not an option, period. Now, is it possible that tomorrow he'll do an Avera? Yeah. But if he does an Avera tomorrow, why will it be? It's because he's not a Benini anymore. Not 
he won't be a Benyani because he'll do an Avera. It's not a, tomorrow we'll do an Avera that he won't be a Benyani. No, a Benyani can't do an Avera. If tomorrow he's doing an Avera, it's because he slipped from his spiritual level and he's not a Benyani anymore and therefore he became capable of the, the Ra, the, the, it took, had, took some sort of advantage inside of him and therefore he was capable of doing an Avera. So that's, it's not that, oh, he was a Benyani and then he did an Avera so he became a Rasha. Or he was a tzaddik, and then he did an Aveda and became a Rasha. No, a tzaddik can't do an Aveda. A Benini can't do an Aveda. That's an oxymoron. By definition, if he's a Benini, he can't do an Aveda. If he did an Aveda, that means he slipped from his level. He's not a Benini anymore, and therefore he did an Aveda. In the current state of Benini, he's in such a state where he's not impacted by any Aveda he ever did. It's as if he never did an Aveda, because he's strong in all areas. The Loyaver, in his current state, it's impossible for him to do an Aveda. Because he's a Benini. Tomorrow, he can, maybe he won't be a Benini. Then maybe he'll do an Aver. But that's nothing to do with where he is right now. And this is a... But why, how do you slip? If it's, if he, since he's a Benini today, that should impact his status in the future. So we, what That's a good question. You're going to have... You, what caused the change? I don't, I'm a little bit confused. You're going to have to hold for, for at least two weeks. To get the answer to that question, because the first question you have to ask is how do how do you become a benyani? One, in other words, we don't. We're, we're right now. We're saying what the benyani is. We didn't say, but how does a person become a benyani? Once you know how a person becomes a benyani, then maybe you can figure out that if he stops doing that because it's not a natural state, then maybe that's how he'll slip. So that we can't answer that yet because we don't yet know what makes someone become a benyani. And then once we know that, then we can figure out how one becomes a benyani, no more benyani. So, but this is a fascinating um, concept of how the past and the present, we usually look at them as something that, don't, that aren't existent right now, but they really are. In other words, my past impacts who I am today. And also there's me, you know. And, um, well, they say that because of the head of Egel, that continues to impact on Jews in every generation. The Chet Egel impacts us in every generation, that's correct. Yeah, Even though it happened in the past, but it's uh, very much part of who we are, correct? In other words, the fact that we're capable of doing Averis is because of the Chet. You said Chet Egel. Chet Egel. Right. More, more so even the Chet Egel. Right. That's even the more... Um... Really? Yep. Okay. In other words, the Chet Egel was what originally brought um, the Eru of Teverah that uh, brought us brought the evil within us and that was suspended for a short while after Ma'an Teira and returned by the Chet Egel. but the original the original grama the original cause of everything is the Chet Eitzadas okay Ach first line, the first word in the line Ach Muhusva Atzmus so this person, the, what did we describe so far about the Benini, that in Machshava de Bermaisa, he is perfect, never did an Avera, never will do an Avera. Ah, however, that's all when it comes to Machshava de Bermaisa. However, Muhus Atzmus Nefesh the essence of the Nefesh is Shehein. What is the essence? As we learned in earlier chapters, Shehein Eser Bechinei Sehaam, the ten components, the Seichel and the Midas, which as discussed in earlier Prakim, Relative to Machshava de Bermaisa, these are considered the essence of the Nefesh Alikis. They're not the only kings. They're not the only, uh, as they say in Yiddish, they're not the only ones with opinions. They're not the only kings over there. Ki'im. In other words, the Nefesh Alikis and Nefesh Bahamas have to share a crown. They're both by the Benini. In terms of what's going on inside, the person's his midas, his desires, his passions, what he desires, his perspectives over there, the nefshal, well, nefshal kiss, and nefshal Bahamas, they're both always duking it out. They're always, they're both there, they're both present. The Benini has not uh, gotten rid of the nefshal Bahamas in any way. The nefshal kiss, the midas of the nefshal kiss do not dominate, do not control the midas of the nefshal Bahamas, with one exception. Ki'im bi'iti muzumanim. Only during certain specific designated times, Kemoi, for example, Bishas Kriyashmaut Fila, during davening, specifically during Kriyashma, during Shman Asre, 
שהיא שס מויכין דה גדלוס למיילה. So when a person is davening here, the Alter is going to introduce a Kabbalistic concept, which we're not going to uh, unpack too much at this point, which is that the fact that a person has ability over here, in this world, during the time of davening, to be able to have that his mind and the Nefshah Lakish should dominate the heart, the Nefshah Bahamas, that's a reflection of the fact that Lamaila in heaven, in Hashem's Moichin, that's a time when Hashem's Moichin are revealed, Hashem's level of moichin, the godless, Hashem's great intellect is revealed. And that allows us to tap into it and during davening also to have a similar effect over here in this world. The gamla mata also down over here, hishasa kaisha, therefore it's an appropriate time, an opportune time. The chol adam to every person, sha'az mekasher chabat shleil Hashem, that if a person connects his chabat to Hashem, in other words, you connect your mind to Hashem, thinking about Hashem. To think deeply into the greatness of the Infinite One. This is what davening is all about. Davening is about thinking about the greatness of Hashem. And to awaken the love. Like fire. In the right side of the heart. Again, we're talking about a Benini. Ava is, uh, we're not talking about Ava Kamaim. Ava Betanugim. That's the Madriga of Atzad the Gomer. But the Benini, but the Benini can have Ava Kriyish Beish. in the right side of the heart. And what is that cause? When a person loves Hashem, it brings about an intense desire. Ludovka to connect to Hashem. Mi'ahava to serve the Eibushter by doing mitzvahs and learning Torah with love. This is all in Shema. Even within Shema itself, what do you have? The Shema begins with Shema Yisrael. What does the word Shema mean? The word Shema is translated as here. But it's much deeper than here. It doesn't mean uh, to literally listen. But Shema means also to understand. Lashon Havana Vasaga. Okay, the Pasuk says, Speak because I'm listening. Listening doesn't mean that I'm, uh, that I, I'm hearing the, the sound waves are entering my, uh, my ears, but it means I understand. Shema means to, um, to contemplate. Now is not the place to talk about it, but in it talks about that's the difference between Ri'iya and Shmiya, between seeing and hearing. Seeing is when something, when I see something, something is revealed to me. When I hear something, the hearing is the idea of understanding, is when I grasp something on my terms. So Shmiya, Shema Yisrael means we're being challenged. Shema Yisrael to understand that Hashem Elikeinu, Hashem Achad, to understand the greatness of Hashem and the unity of Hashem. That's what Shema is all about. And what does that immediately lead to? The next passage, is to have an ahava for Hashem. And when I have an ahava for Hashem, what does that mean to? That what? That doing mitzvahs. So those are, if you look back in the words of Tanya, the Rebbe says, what do we do during davening? To think deeply into the greatness of Hashem. That's Shema Yisrael. To awaken the love, that's via hafta Hashem alikacha. And what is the purpose of this ladavka bait to connect Hashem? Which is the next pasuk? That's what Shema is all about. Midiraisa, all we need is Shema. However, the Rabbanon came along, and because, as we know, we believe that there's something called the Yeridas Hadiras, which means that uh, as the generations continue, the neshamas are lower and lower. We've spoken about this in the past in Peri Beis, how Klal Yisrael is compared to a, to a large body. And in today's days, we're like the little, uh, we're like the, the toenails um, of the entire larger body of Klal Yisrael. But in general, over the generations, we've become lower and lower and lower. And although this uh, understanding is sometimes challenged when we learn Tanakh, and we read about these people, and sometimes we wonder about how great these people were, but that's only because we're approaching it with a very simple mind. But if we look in the in the in the Sfarim Hakadoshim and the Holy Sfarim, it explains how these people were really incredibly great people. I mean, the people who went out of Mitzrayim were called the Derdea, 
So it used to be these people, what does it mean greater people? Does that mean they were smarter than us? Not necessarily. Perhaps, but that's not, uh, that's not what it means. It means they were, sp more, they were more spiritually attuned and more spiritually sensitive than we are today. We're like, uh, you know, just a, a toenail. How much feeling does it have in the toenail? <clears throat> Pretty much none. Sorry? Yeah, but big, what are you feeling? The toenail or, di or digging into your flesh? What are you feeling? The flesh. It's the flesh. It's the flesh. The toenail itself it barely has any feeling whatsoever, if, if any. <clears throat> you can cut it, right? So they were very, very spiritual. In other words, in fact, even, you know, you look in Nach and you see all about the Yidin always worshipping of the Zara. And we can't relate to that. But that's because we're so spiritually insensitive that uh, our desires are ice cream and chocolate. That's okay, that's a metaphor. But our desires are, 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 are materialistic. And their tithes that they had were totally spiritual, which we can't even relate to. Because they were such spiritual people. And there's always the Zalu Maza, there's always that counterbalance of how great you are, so you have a, a great Yetzirah. But what was the Yetzirah for? They weren't running after, uh, they weren't running after what we're running after today. They were running after spiritual, uh, the spiritual uh, ice creams and chocolates. You mean the gurus? Sorry? You're talking about the gurus. Those type of the gurus? Yeah, like, like, uh, like I've already said something. Yeah? Doesn't it say that the reason that uh, they believed in or they served the Bodhisattva was that it gave them a hatred for immorality? So that I mean, uh, how maybe it's just you know, uh, uh, you know, an excuse you know to for immorality. You're saying that they were very spiritually. Uh, yeah, that's not really the topic. That's correct. That, this is a little of a tangent. We could talk about it some other time. But what I'm saying is Miyusa than on the words of Chazal. Very much me use it. Reb Tzadik HaKoyin of Lublin talks about this a lot. It's, um, it's me use it, what I'm saying. They were holy people. They were spiritual people. And uh, they were all from, by the way. All these Eved Eved Ezer were from people. You know, the biggest uh, Achav was the biggest, uh, all awful of Eved Eved Ezer. He had a from kitchen. El Yawa Navi, you know, the, the, the birds brought El Yawa Navi food from his kitchen. He had a, he had a kosher kitchen. Yomara says, imagine that Achav, who would think? You think that the person, the biggest David of Zara in the world, the first thing you leave behind. There is there anyone today who becomes a Christian but keeps on keeping kosher, or a chves? That's the first thing. But no, it, well, these things. It wasn't. They weren't looking to escape, and they weren't looking. Um, okay, but that's again. That's that. This is very beside the point. The point we're trying to say over here is that it used to be in times of the before by Yisrushin, etc. They were such holy people. They would say Shema, which is the mitzvah same in Torah. And they arrived, they said Shema, and they fell into the greatness of Hashem, and they said Vahafta, and they arrived at love for Hashem, and then they, uh, and that motivated them right away to do Teir Mitzvahs. And then there was Yerida Sadeir Tacham Masal, we're not ready for Shema. Before we do Shema, we need some preparation. So even though Shema is the centerpiece of davening, but we need to, we can't, we can't jump right there, so we need to have what's called Birchas Kishma. And what is it? But Birchas Kishma is kind of funny. Because usually, you know, when we have a bracha on a mitzvah, we say, Yashar the Shalom mitzvah, Yisav Tzivanu, on whatever the mitzvah is. And here we have the, we call it Birchas Krishma, but it's, we don't say, Yashar the Shalom mitzvah, Yisav Tzivanu, Likres Krishma. But it, it, it seems to go off completely in tangents in one way or another way. So it's explained in Chassidus that Birchas Krishma are preparation for Krishma. They're, they're warming you up, they're getting you into the mood. When you're looking, you're talking about the greatness of Hashem, Kaddish, 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 and all the Malachim and all the Shrafim and Chayis, and every single one of them, they're all, um, they're all uh, completely, you know, Einim Be'emav, Einim Be'yira, Kulam Makabim Le'emel Machashmaim, all these things, and you think about the greatness of Hashem, how the Malachim are, are completely in awe of Hashem. And then we turn, you know, Ava Selam Aftan, we talk about how, despite the fact that you have all these holy Malachim, who does the Eibishter love? The Eibishter loves us. Kind of funny. The Eibishter has Malachim in heaven and he decides he wants me and you and you and you. By the time we get to Shema, we're supposed to be already at that spiritual state where when we say Shema, it can have the desired impact. And we think it's the greatness of Hashem. Then when we get to Vyahafta, we're ready, ready, Taka. We have a love for Hashem within our hearts. And that's why the Brachas from the Rabbanon, because that came at a later stage in the game. So that's what he's saying inside. 
This idea of loving Hashem, of thinking of the greatness of Hashem, and loving Hashem, and um, committing ourselves to doing Torah mitzvahs. So that Zau Inyan Hamavur, this is what's explained by Kriyashma, which is the Iraisa, and also a Birchisa, Sholafana, Olachara, the Brachis before and then afterwards, Shahin Madrabanan, which are Madrabanan, Hain Hachana, Likim Akrishma, they prepare us to be able to, it's an interesting word, Likim Akrishma, what does it mean to be, you ever heard this word, Kim Akrishma? What is the Kim of Krishma? It's not just saying the words, but actually, that when you're saying the words, you're relating to the words. When you're saying Shma, you're actually doing Shma, and when you're saying Vahafta, you're actually doing Vahafta. The Oz, and then Harash Bechalal Hasmali, the evil which is within the left side of the heart, is Take Kafufu Batl Latif. It's Take Batl. You don't feel the evil in your heart. It is Batl Latif, I'm a spash at Bechalal, your money to the goodness which is in the right side, Mechabad, Shemamayach, the love for Hashem which is being felt currently in the right side of the heart. Which is being motivated again by the Chabad Shebemoyach, which is in the mind, Hamukusharim, which is connected at that time. The mind is connected, Big Dulas in Sayyid Baracho. Falter Rebbe is telling us something incredible over here. This is very, uh, very important. And as we'll see later on, this becomes, uh, this becomes very important. We are not Tzadikim, all of us here in the room. I'm, I'm assuming that. <laughs> We, we, we are people who struggle in life. The Nefesh Bahamas is at full force, at least at full force, in other words. And uh, we have typhus, we have desires, we have inappropriate desires. And life is a struggle. However, even if you're not a tzaddik, there is supposed to be one time during the day when you're not struggling. It's a special time. As Dr. Rebbe says, it's not just due to your own efforts. You're also assisted by the fact that Lamaila above, as we said, there's, there's a shas moichin de godless. It's a time when Hashem's moichin are present and very much revealed. That allows us to connect our mind in thinking about Hashem and awaken a love for Hashem within our heart. And at that moment, during davening, when we're saying Krishma, when we're davening, everyone, can reach a point where the Yitzhahara that Hashem Bahamas is hibernating. It realizes now is not the time, not because it willingly acquiesces, but it realizes that due to the feelings that you're experiencing at this moment during davening, it doesn't have a chance, it goes to sleep. It's going to wake up after davening. It didn't go away, it didn't disappear. And... Um, but there are those moments that we experience. Even those of us who are the strugglers, even when I'm talking about tzaddikim, we have those moments when there is this domination of the nafsh lakis over the nafsh bahamas. And these moments, as we're going to see as we continue in the Perik, are very important. Because even though later on in the day, my nafsh bahamas is going to reawaken, but those moments of domination that I had during davening, they leave an impression on my entire day, as we'll see later on. Davening is a very important part of our Avedah. It allows us to serve Hashem the entire day. But again, the entire day, I'm struggling with my Nefshah Bahamas. Right now, I am not struggling with my Nefshah Bahamas. Um, but it's a temporary state, but it's an important part of every single day. But at the same time, we have to understand that it's only temporary. Meaning to say, for those of us who have experienced those moments when we're davening and when we feel connected and we feel love for Hashem and awe for Hashem, a desire to do Teir Mitzvahs, I think everyone here to a certain extent has, has, has had that feeling, whether it's during a davening, whether it's sitting by the Pesach Seder, wherever it may be, that feeling of spiritual, uh, of being on a spiritual high, when the Nefshah Bahamas has been, again, subdued. It's been subdued. Right. But sometimes the problem is, and I think it's not only sometimes, but a lot of times, we're like, oh, this is unbelievable, and I'm going to do only mitzvahs and Torah. And um, 
we kind of foolishly assume that the state that we're in is going to continue. Even though we know that this is, I, I'm going to leave Yom Kippur, I'm going to leave in the Yilatim, and I'm going to leave the davening, but yeah, of course I'm not going to do any Averis, of course I'm going to do only mitzvahs, I'm going to do what Hashem wants. And then you walk out in the street and you bang your nose, and it's all over, you know, and Hashem Hamas is back, and, so, and everything disappeared. But I think that also that's because when you were a little delusional, when you're in a state of inspiration, you have to realize and be cognizant of the fact in two hours you're not going to be in a state of inspiration. You're going to have to battle. And you have to be ready for that battle. Don't think that just because right now you can't envision yourself doing an Avera. And right now you would love to do every mitzvah. So, okay, so it's going to be easy going from here on. I know it sounds silly, but there is a little voice in the back of our head which tells us that. Like, oh, great, I'm at this spiritual state, and from here everything is just going to... Everything's going to be smooth sailing. But we're, but we're Benyanis, we're strugglers. That's not our lot in life. And that's what he's going to say right now. Six lines from the bottom, but after one davens, when the time of Meichlun, the godless of Hashem, goes away, the Ra wakes up. So after davening, the Yitzhar Hara, the Nafshah Bahamas, wakes up. It's at full force. So let's stop over here for a moment. What did we say so far? We said, the Tzaddik is someone who the Nefesh Halikis has overpowered. The Rasha is someone who the Nefesh Bahamas has overpowered, which is why he does Averis. And not, he does Averis that makes him a Rasha. He's a, and a, you know, that's really a new understanding. You always ask, why is someone a Rasha? Because he does Averis. No. He does Averis because he's a Rasha. The Rasha is someone who the evil has overpowered, and that's why he's able to do Averis. The Bainini is someone who the Nefshah Bahamas, Nefshah Lakis, and the inside. Equilibrium. E- equilibrium, right? They're both equally strong, except for during Davening. During Davening is when the Nefshah Lakis takes advantage. In other words, not, during Davening, not only is the Nefshah Lakis in control of speech, action, and thoughts, but also in control of the Midas. The Midas, the love of the Nefshah Lakis, it alone is the one. And that raises the obvious question, which is, if there's equilibrium the rest of the day, then why is the person, do, why is the Benini doing only mitzvahs? It should be half and half. If the Nefesh Elikis and Nefesh are both at full force, why does the Nefesh Elikis enjoy this advantage that in Machshava Dibar Maisa, it alone is fully in control? Siyat the Shmaya, we're going to get into that soon. But there's also something else at play here. If you remember, in the beginning of Perik Tess, after the Alter Rebbe finished describing in the previous chapters the entire Nefesh Elikis, and after he finished describing the Nefesh Bahamas, <coughs> so after all that, the Alter Rebbe says, by the way, one more thing I have to tell you. Before he starts describing the battle, and he says that we're is the home base of the Nefesh Lakis, and we're is the home base of the Nefesh Bahamas. The Nefesh Lakis is in the mind, and the Shabahamas is in the heart. And if you remember, we spoke then, we said, at a later point in time, you'll understand why it's important to know that the Nefesh Lakis is primarily based on the mind, and the Shabahamas is primarily based on the heart. And here's where it's going to become important. There's a rule, a rule of human nature, which is called Mayach Shalat Al-Halev. The mind rules the heart. Which means, if the mind is at full force, and the heart is at full force, the mind is going to be victorious every single time. It's almost like an advantage of height, and if Shalakis is higher, it's in the mind. You know, it's not coincidental, but the animals, the head and the heart, are, uh, are more or less on the same level. And by the, by the human being, the head is held up high. And that's because by the human being, the head is higher. It's in control. And that's true by every person. This is something which is part of human nature. Um, in fact, not only is it part of human nature, you can argue that it's the definition of a human being. 
Mayich Shata Alev is what defines the human being. What's the difference between a human being and an animal? Uh, so an animal has intellect. Uh, sure it does. An animal can't reason. An animal reason logic. You're talking about abstract, th- abstract thinking. No. Okay. So that doesn't mean it doesn't have intellect. It means that there's a certain quality within intellect called abstract thinking or self-assessment or those kind of things. It doesn't possess. But there are animals that are quite smart, depending on which species of animal which you're talking about. But animals definitely have, you know, they do different tests on the monkeys with the bananas and with the sticks and how many sticks can it put together till, till you know what I'm talking about, to get the banana? And they do it. Animals have intelligence. What were you saying? Sorry? I was saying that uh, I thought that uh, uh, they don't have free will. Or... And, okay, that's true. But what does that mean? What gives us free will or why don't animals have free will? I'm taking this a little deeper. Which is, the human being is the only species. And this is also the, scientifically to talk about this. There are many things that separate the human being from the animal, but they're all, uh, they're all uh, quantitative. They're not qual- we, uh, we have this much, they have that much. So they- the one thing that qualitatively separates the human being from the animal is the idea that I can act opposite of my instincts and my impulse and my desires and my nature. And that's a uniquely human characteristic. But another thing which is interesting about human beings is that um, we're the only ones really that have long-term relationships. Real, lasting, and long-term relationships. Okay, so I'm not going to... Th- there might be exceptions to this rule, but I've actually, I've actually researched this a little. Yeah. And um, there's... Even those species of animals and birds that are officially monogamous aren't. In other words, more or less they have the same partner, but they found that like even in those birds that were monogamous, like like 25% of the eggs when they did DNA checks were not from the father, they were from someone else. So, um, and even then it's more of idea of practical because they offer, um, but, the, but the idea of a relationship, the idea to be in a relationship, you need to have more shot all left. If you can't control your impulses and your instincts, you're not staying married for very long. You know, uh, the, um, a cornerstone of every relationship is being able to put myself and my desires aside. And when I come home from work and I'm tired and my wife says, can you do this for me? So my heart definitely says, absolutely not. And I want to relax. But means my mind says this is what has to be done when duty and responsibility trumps um, my impulses and my instincts. And that's a uniquely human thing. Animals are controlled by their instincts. Their intellect is in the service of their instincts. Meaning if they want something, their intellect will figure out how to achieve it, to gain it, um, or to attain it, etc. So the human being has this thing called Mayushat Alev. So therefore, if the Nefshalakis is based in the mind, and the and the godly soul is most is, is primarily understanding, yes, it filters down. And also we start loving Hashem also. But it starts with our understanding of Hashem and our appreciation of Hashem in our mind, as opposed to the animal soul, which everything starts as an instinct and an impulse in the heart, and only afterwards the mind jumps onto the train. So therefore, naturally, the Nef Shalakis has an advantage because the mind always has an advantage over the heart. Now, I would like to point out that when we say Moyach Shalt al the mind controls the heart, there are two ways to understand that. There are two possible meanings. And depending where you're looking at this, you'll see one of these ways. Sometimes when we talk about Moyach Shalt al the mind dominates and controls the heart. What it means to say is, that the mind can actually control the feelings of the heart. That if I think for long enough about something, my feelings will uh, will respond in, li- in, in, uh, in life. And we just saw that by davening. By davening, he said, think into the greatness of Hashem, and that's going to make the mayach shalt alalev, the mind is going to control the heart, and the heart also will start feeling a love for Hashem. That's one way of understanding and looking at the Mayr Shalt al but there's another way. And that is 
that my mind understands one thing. It has not succeeded for whatever reason at this point, excuse me, at this point in transforming the heart and making that the heart should be in sync with it. Shalit, it dominates. It gets its way even when the heart wants something different. My heart can say, I want this. My heart can say, okay, we're well, using the heart loose to you. I mean, my, my, it, that means my desires, my passions. My, uh, and my mind says, no, I know you want that, and I can't change the fact that you want that, but we're not doing that. We're not doing that. That's Moir Shatla, that's the second way. And in terms of the second, this second idea of Moir Shatla Alev, the Alter Rebbe is going to say, that is talking about in the mind, it's called Ritzoy Neishebe In other words, in the mind there are two aspects. There's the, there's the willpower of the mind, and then there is the intellect, so to say, of the mind. The intellect of the mind transforms my emotions. The willpower in my mind overrides my emotions. During davening, the intellect of the mind, in other words, we think greatly into the, into the greatness of Hashem, then the intellect of the mind reshapes my emotions to the point that I come to love Hashem. During the rest of the day, when my, when my heart desire something over here we're not talking about reshaping your heart it's overriding the heart and how does that happen that happens to the willpower in my mind and because of that willpower in my mind i have my mind can control my heart and this explains why the bainini although the nefshalakis and nefshabamas are both at full power full strength the nefshabahamas has not been diminished whatsoever the Bainini is someone who struggles with desires and with different thoughts and with different issues and uh, selfishness and laziness and anger. Every single one of these traits that we struggle with, the Bainini also struggles with. Because we are the Bainini, as we discussed many times. So if so, if the Nefsh Bahamas had full force, and this is something we feel, how can I serve Hashem if I weaken my Nefsh Bahamas? No, you don't have to weaken it. If you're strengthening your Nefsh kiss. If your nefesh alakis will be at full force, you'll automatically do whatever is right. Because my not all left. Let's do this inside. Three lines from the bottom. Rak, however, because yes, the nefesh Baham is at full force, but because it it, it, it alone does not have mishpat hamluchav and it alone, it's not the only uh, it's not the only king in the city. The <laughs> can never make that its tivus, its desires, it cannot actually um, bring them into fruition. It can't make, it can't express itself in the limbs of the body. In action and speech and in thought. That if Shabbos will never get its way, that the person should actually take time to contemplate the pleasures of this world. And to try to figure out how to do its tivus. The person, in other words, the Bainini never even entertains the thoughts of the Nafshah Bahamas. Yes, the thoughts come to its mind, but it throws them away right away. Why? Because the mind rules the heart. As is explained in Rai Mahemna, in Parshas Pinchas, This is something which is human nature. From birth, this is the nature of the way we were created. This is how a person is um, created. Every person has the ability using the willpower in his mind. How do you say that in English? To uh, refrain. To refrain. It's not as good as to That's Yiddish. Right. The limb shall and to rule over beruach tavasi should believe to control the desires of the heart. Shalila malus mashalus libe the mind can control and make sure the person does not fulfill his desires, not b'maisa and not in dibor and not on machshava. Will asiach daiti legamri to completely take away the mind mitayvas libe ala hepech legamri from the that a person from the desires of the heart. To make it to distract it, and the person should start thinking something else entirely. So why Russia doesn't have this quality? This seems to be like uh, 
something that's acquired, so like a default. Of, of, well, well, how <coughs> the, the, the Rosh Hashanah Gomer, why doesn't he uh, ever have this uh, capability of um, that there's Mark should be Shalar Shalad Alulayf? The story is said about the Ruzhner, that when he was a young boy, so his Malamud would teach him Chumash, and before the Malamud got to Rashi, every single time the Ruzhner would ask the question which Rashi, which Rashi is coming to address. Because after all, what is Rashi there to do? Rashi is there. There's this difficulty in the Pasuk. Every, every Rashi, even if it doesn't begin with a question, is there to address a certain question, a certain difficulty. So the Ruzhner was obviously, was the Ruzhner was so bright that he never, he didn't wait for the for Rashi to start. He would ask the question always, every single time. And then the Malamed got to Parshas Vayetze. So there it says, Vihine Malachei Lekim. The angels of Hashem, Oilim Vayerdim Bay, were going up and were going down. So Rashi explains that this is the Malachim of Rashi Sral and Chutzlar. It's why, because what's the difficulty in the Pasuk? Is that if they're angels, where, where where do angels live in heaven? So why does it say that the angels are going coming going going up and coming down? It should be the opposite. They're, down, they're going down, they're not going up. So therefore, Rashi explains that the malachim of Chutzla, uh, of Eretz Yisrael, which were with Yaakov, were going up, and the malachim of Chutzla, which were coming down. So the Malamed learned the pasuk with uh, the Ruzhner, and then he stopped. He was waiting, as always, for the Ruzhner to ask the question and then to move on to Rashi, because that was the way he was the first. Uh, Eight parshas in the Torah, and the Rishon is quiet, not asking any questions. So Mama says, "You have any questions on the pasuk?" He says, "No." So he says, "What about the Elam v'Yerdim? Doesn't bother you the fact that it says that the first they're going up and they're going down?" The Rishon says, "Listen, I'll tell you the truth. It's a dream, and in a dream anything can happen. And this is a vision the Yaakov had in the dream, so it wasn't. Uh, he didn't. He, there's no questions on a dream." <laughs> Anyway, I've noticed over the last few prakim that every time that there's a question going to be asked, you're at, you ask it first. You're like the Ruzhner. You sense the question, and you ask it. That's uh, a few times already. It's good. It's good. It's very good. <clears throat> that preempted. You preempt it, right? And your question is a very good question. And your question is, if the nefesh alakis is based in the mind, and if the Nefesh Baham is based on the heart, and the rule is that that the mind rules over the heart, then that should be a rule which is true for everyone. Then there shouldn't be the possibility of a Russia. A Russia shouldn't exist. Okay. That's the right. That's the position. Exactly right. Right. But you know, some questions are very good in the realm of the abstract and the theory, but they don't they don't work practically. Meaning to say. Is Moyach Shalat Allah, is it a rule? Let's say, I didn't, let's say we didn't learn Tanya. Let's say we didn't learn this. And I asked you a question. Which is more powerful, the mind or the heart? What would you answer? The heart. The heart is more powerful. On a daily basis, every single day, we operate on the, on the basis of Moyach Shalat Allah. Do you work? Yes, it was. What time do you have to be at work in the morning? 9 o'clock, 9.30. 9 o'clock, 9.30. And what if you don't want to be in work? And what do you do? Every time you decide, you wake up in the morning and, and you're not in the mood today going to work, you take off the day? No. So, Meir Shalat Alev operates by you every single day. Your heart, when I say your heart, I, I, you know, today you talk about the heart, you're talking about your love life. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about your heart as in your, your instincts, your impulse, your desires, right? Yeah. I have to do it, that's all. We, as human beings, as responsible adults, Meir Shalat Alev is in every single area of our life. Anyone who, anyone who wants to eat healthy, anyone who wants to, in other words, all these things which we do, which our mind dictates that we have to do, and our heart tells us otherwise, and every single day, if you looked at today, how many, what would your day have looked like if you followed your Lev, if your heart was in control of your mind? Chaos. Would have been chaos, you 
Would you be paying bills? Would you? In other words, That's everything so that uh, right. So Meich Shant Alev, the Alter Rebbe makes takes pains to point this out. He's saying this is not something that you learn in Zayar and say, "I believe, I believe that Meich Shant Alev." It's a fact of life. It's part of human nature that the mind overrides the desires and impulses of the heart. Again, if it doesn't, then we're talking about an eight-year-old child. Children aren't Meich Shant Alev. So I turn to you and I ask you the question. If Mayak Shalt al eleven, if that's a human rule, then why is it that people mess up so often and they listen to the heart instead of the mind? In other words, your question is it a question on Tanya or is it a question on humanity? And once we answer, uh, understand the answer to that, we'll also understand the answer to, que- the, um, to your question with regards to Tanya. So what, what is the, what is the answer to that? Why is it that despite the fact that by human nature the mind always has the ability? To control the heart, but we have free will. What does that mean? Person can make uh, bad choices. How about it? You can choose to be he good. Be he can be influenced by his ace of heart at that moment. You notice four lines from the top of the words that the Rebbe uses. Shekol Adam, every single person, Yochel, Bersanya Shebe Moeche, can, using the willpower and the mind, Lisapik, to control himself, etc. The word Yochel is very key. He's, the world would look. The world would be a very different place if, in actuality, the mind always controlled the heart. The Alter Rebbe is saying only is that the mind has the ability to control the heart. But what if the mind, for whatever reason, has been compromised or is weakened or isn't that resolute or has been put into hibernation? What happens when when our impulses take control of us? What that means is, is that we haven't exerted our minds really. Because had we exerted our minds, it would have... Yochel, we can. We don't. We're lazy. And that's precisely what we're saying. When the mind and the heart, when the mind and the heart are at full force, then the mind controls the heart. But if the mind has been compromised, then you won't have that, that quality. So the, the, the advantage that Nefshel Akis has over Nefshel Mahamis is in its potential, is in its ability. Does it always fulfill that potential? No. Not necessarily. So now the question is, what's the next question? No? How do I make sure that my mind is always in control, is always in control and fully there and therefore able to control the Nefshel Mahamis? You have to study the what? I assume you have to study the Tanya. Yes, and the answer is going to be in the first paragraph, which we're going to learn next week, Mr. Hashem. In other words, this is part of a process. First, we have to understand what the Bainini is. The Bainini is the one who the, the, they're both equal and equal power, except for during davening. But otherwise, they're equal power. And the Nefshel case has not been compromised by anything, not even by an Aveira in the past, as we discussed. And when they're equal power, it is in control. Why is it in control? It's because Meir Shalat Alev. We didn't yet explain how do we get to that state of equal power. How do I get that my mind should be, and my, my natural key should be fully operational and empowered to the point, and when that happens, obviously, you have Meir Shalat Alev, and that's what we're going to start talking about next week in Mir Tzashem. equilibrium for the mind to be Because if, if there is no equilibrium, then you're a Russia. That's the whole point we're saying. What is a Russia? Again, a Russia is not someone who does Averis. A person does Averis because of a Russia. A Russia is someone who the, the national case is not at, has been weakened. It's been compromised. It's been compromised. And therefore, the Meir Shatalev isn't working. But when they're at full force, then you do have Meir Shatalev. Just like, just like in our life, if my mind is being fully exercised, it will control the heart. So, I assume that a person can't be in control this way unless. He's connected to a Sadi who can guide him. That's probably correct. Although the Alter Rebbe doesn't talk about it in this period, but uh, that's definitely uh, a true point, which is that we need uh, we need assistance from the outside also. Correct. If you're asking, how is it possible? Is yeah, it- but we're going to get there. Actually, I mean, the key is going to be actually what we already learned is we need to be davening. Mm-hmm. Actually, davening is is the place where the Nefshalik is fills up on gas every single day. That's what we're going to talk about next week. So the 